Please welcome to the stage Andres Oppenheimer, Foreign Affairs columnist at El Nuevo Herald and Miami Herald, and our esteemed panel. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Does this work? Yes? Okay. Thanks for being with us to our panel on uh, technology and democracy. Well, my five, 10 second introduction, we all know that democracy, there is a growing sentiment that democracy is under threat in the Americas, threatened not only by populist demagogues, but also by new technologies at their disposal. To put it in the words of uh, Ronnie Abowitz, was with us and Julio Frank, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase them in a recent paper. The present day fight between liberty and oppression is not just a battle of world leaders for other countries' economic resources and territory, but also a battle of operating systems trying to control the world's population. So let's start with the obvious question. Ronnie Abowitz. Is technology strengthening or weakening democracy in the Americas? Thank you, Andres. Um, as we sit here today, I would say it's asymmetrical. Right now, technology is really working against democracy because a lot of the technology we know are controlled by, I'd say, autocratic, centrally controlled, very large superpower companies. And to some extent, Governments and countries around the world have mirrored that, and they're using these systems as tools of oppression, control, influence, micro-influence. Uh, but there's also an emerging possibility for democracy to be moved to technology. What I mean by that is there's the emergence of blockchains, decentralized autonomous organizations, where you can have self-sovereign systems that could actually really preserve the possibility of democracy. So, I'm simultaneously very pessimistic, but optimistic. Uh, we're sort of in one of those interesting quantum moments where you're not quite sure, it's like a qubit. Um, the possibilities are endless, but right now I think it's asymmetrical. It's more in favor of computational autocracy, which I think is why we're here today to really push the idea that we really need to move computing to a much more open, democratic, uh, and just system. I've heard you say, when talking about the threat to democracy, posed by technology, that uh, you're proposing something like a constitutional convention, like a Philadelphia Convention on Computational Democracy. What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it, it's an idea i uh, talked to President Frank about for, for a while, but the idea that um, we're at this moment in time where we should have the Philadelphia Convention, which was if you, you know, know US history, it's where all the great thinkers uh, in the US at the time came together to conceive of the, the, the Constitution and the principles by which this country could run and also to create templates for democratic operations around the world because we were going to be the first country not governed by a king or a monarch or a dictator. Uh, I feel like we need to do that again and like restate democratic values with the greatest thinkers in the country and around the world and also think about how that applies to technology and how self-sovereign systems may be able to preserve this idea. So I think the idea of a Philadelphia Convention, a Constitutional Congress, calling that again would be amazing. Maybe we do it here at UM, President Frank. <laughs> but Ronnie, b before I go to Alberto Barguen, isn't there a danger that that can open a can of worms? I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because those of you who follow Latin America, Chile has just had a Constitutional Convention. They came out with a 500 article new constitution, which is a huge mess. Wouldn't that sort of complicate matters more? So I'll give you my opinion. Um, I'm an agile technologist, meaning you have to constantly look and revise what our founding fathers came up with in the 1700s, excluded women, people of color, so many others that you know it's okay to look and to upgrade and improve where we are and to look at the technology today. And I would say 99% confidence if they were around, they would do it because they were enlightened, they were progressive, they were liberal. Uh, they ran away from the conservative autocracy that they found in Europe. So of course they were modern thinkers like Benjamin Franklin, of course he would want to do it again and, and reboot and restate. And I would say the can of worms is open. Uh, it's running all over the stage right now. Alberto Ibargüen, 
Are you going to be the first in line to sign up for Ronnie's constitutional convention? I think it should scare, scare the hell out of anybody to think <laughs> about. But, but you, you poke, you put, it's like an amoeba under a microscope. You poke the little bastard and you have no idea where it's going to go. Uh, so, so be careful what you wish for. On the other hand, I look at it from the perspective of local news, which is what we do at, uh, at Knight Foundation. And I think it's... It, we, have, we, we are headed into blindness. We, ha we have a structure for democracy that is based on geography. You elect congresspeople and mayors and, and commissioners by geography. And for the first time in the history of the republic, we have decoupled the way we inform ourselves with the people we elect, with the way we elect, with the structure that we use, the geographically based structure that we use. And so the end result is that you can find out what's going on in Ukraine. But I, I know you're a well-informed individual, but I promise you, you don't know what's happening at the county commission. Uh, why? Because the work is not being done. There is no, the, the local reporting that we used to rely on to tell us what's happening locally, who's running locally. Now we publish uh, basically, well, I don't want to, let's say press releases or it, 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 it and and given given the available technology uh, it is really very difficult for an average citizen to decide between wheat and chaff I think I think this calls for radical solutions and this may be a little too radical I don't know um, but there's 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 really a germ there we need to rethink it Jefferson had it right when he talked about a government without newspapers or preferring a newspaper without government, be not be, which reporters love to cite, but the next, the next sentence in that letter, in that famous letter, was because the, the essential part of a democratic republic is an informed citizenry, and we just don't have that at the base. Alberto, but okay, I, I get your point. You make a good point about us not being focused on not getting enough good local news, but what should be done? I mean, there is a problem with technology, with demagogues, populists, tyrants getting hold of technologies for surveillance, fake news, you name it, in Latin America, for instance. But, but, so you don't like Ronnie's idea, but what should be done? No, no, no. I didn't say I didn't like the idea. I said it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure I don't like it. Uh, sometimes you have to drink the castor oil uh, in order to get better, and maybe that's what we need to do. But there are other things we can do. Look, we we have uh, Section 230 of the Communications uh, uh, Decency Act, I think was a formal name of it, that that protects um, that protects uh, platforms from any liability. What would happen if suddenly you said, "Oh, for goodness sake, these are publishers like any publisher, and you're liable for the damage you may do." That doesn't automatically mean that just because I complain, I get to charge you. Some, you know, I get, I get some money out of you. But it will mean that billions of dollars will be invested by those companies in figuring out how to provide a safer envi environment. Um, similarly, and, I mean, it, it seems to me we, we're, we're investing. Well, it's not billions of dollars, but we're, we, in the last couple of years, we've invested some $60 million in having scholars from around the country looking at a range of options like, uh, the, the, like the kind of thing that Ronnie's proposing um, and looking at, at whether there aren't legislative solutions uh, to some of these problems and what the consequences would be and getting people from left, center, and right uh, to explore these ideas so that we're doing more than just simply talking about my personal gut reaction to things, but, but have uh, scholars who have been thinking about this for a long time make proposals to policymakers. Is there a timetable for that? Are they going to come up with a paper, with a proposal? There are too many of them, and they're too disparate at this point. <laughs> I, no, really. I mean, that's why, and that's why it costs that much money. We've, we've re literally seeded five centers, and I think uh, we've funded something like 30 or 40 other um, uh, scholarly projects. Some of them from... Uh, but but with, quickly, Alberto, before go, going on with, with Tamara, if you don't structure it, I mean, I, I understand that you, you're scared about Ronnie's idea, but if you don't structure it, it's going to be dispersed. It's going to be 100 academics putting each of them their own paper. You start with one cat. 
and then another one, and then you pretty soon you try to herd the cats. And so my view is first we start with funding the scholarship, then we start bringing them together, then we start publishing, um, then we start influencing um, uh, elected leaders. I think you've got to take, you've got to, I, we're not running, we're walking. Before we get to Tamara, Ronnie, what do you think about that idea? I'll, I'll take my, my sort of uh, more futuristic like tech position. I, I really feel we're in a place where the impact of very sophisticated technologies is so strong, so profound, and so unknown to so many, and it does affect democracy, the act of governance in so many ways, that it really is time to have, have sort of this like reboot constitutional Congress to look at its impact and to mesh them together for the next few hundred years. Because there's a chance if we don't, we devolve away from democracy into a kind of autocratic nationalism. And we were a country that once had a democracy. It happened in Rome. Uh, that's, that terrifies me. So the, this recommitting to the principles of democracy in the modern age with technology and with all that it means, I think is necessary, including the idea that maybe we have to preserve democracy on self-sovereign systems which for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar, it could move the principles beyond the realm of human corruption. You could put it into a gigantic self-sovereign network where our core principles and thoughts sort of live outside the realm of human corruption and manip manipulation. And I think it's worth a discussion. That's a because 200 problem. years from now, we don't want to be, we used to be a democracy and now we're something else. Tamara, you're an expert on democracies and autocracies. Tamara is the head of uh, uh, Human Rights Watch for Latin America. And give us a little bit of a panoramic view of what's happening in Latin America, because we all know about the threat that technology is posing in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in dictatorships where dictators are using technologies to their advantage. But what about the other countries? What about Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, the, the, the big democracies? Is that happening there as well? Yeah, I, to, I think to frame this conversation, it's about to highlight two things. One is, as Alberto said, democracy requires informed citizens, and technology can play a critical role in generating, uh, empowering people with a quality information. Now, technology also exists, and it has an impact on human rights, and this is not an academic discussion in Latin America, as you were saying. You know, so just, I'll give you a couple of examples. In Mexico, for example, the government under Peña Nieto used surveillance, which is an extremely useful technology to investigate crime, to harass and spy on human rights defenders and on independent journalists. And you know, taking this back, in Latin America today, human rights defenders and independent journalists are playing a, criti a critical role exposing government abuse, exposing corruption. So when you, know, you see a government that uses technology against the people who are actually key players protecting democracy, you have a very big problem. And the other problem, you know, it, it, in Mexico, this was so, so extreme that they ended up using this technology to, in, to surveil family members and independent experts who were investigating the disappearance of 43 students. So instead of investigating the actual crime, they were investigating the people pushing for accountability in a country and in a region where impunity is the rule. And another example, I think you know, the other important point is technology goes way faster than our ability to regulate it. And what we're seeing in Latin America is that the regulations you know, when they exist, they are poor, and this concentration of power in certain autocrats allow them to use their influence in the legislature to pass laws that make absolutely no sense. So look at El Salvador, for example. They passed a cyber crimes law where they allowed for the creation of undercover digital agents that conduct undercover digital operations to investigate, and that's you know, that vague language and those provisions just open the door to abuse. But I do want to highlight that technology, you know, can be used for the good. And I hope that's your next question on this. It will, but before we get to <laughs> that, Tamara, uh, is that a homegrown thing? Is it, do we have dictators there who say, hey, who are the wizards? Who are the whiskits about all this and what can they do to help me, you know, crack down on dissidents? 
or other extra regional powers, China, Russia, you name them, who are actively involved in this. What do we know about, again, forget about Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, we know what they, what they do, but what about the others? Are China and Russia actually intervening technologically in these countries? I think it's a combination of different sources of technology, but what allows this goes to the core of democracy, which is in many of these countries, you don't have independent checks on executive power. So they can get their hands on technology and use it because they won't be held accountable by an independent judiciary and they use it against independent journalists and they use it against human rights defenders who are, you know, these defenders, these journalists, these prosecutors and these judges are the ones who are holding the fort. Because but, Tamara, but, but are these technology companies private or are they foreign countries that are offering the technology? I think you have both. You can't generalize. I mean, in Latin America, there is a huge market. And, you know, technology companies and foreign powers are taking advantage of the market that exists and that this technology is being used. So you're, you're, you're talking about something that would require a fundamental structural change, which goes back to the Constitutional Convention yeah. idea. Damana, and before we get to President Frank, uh, going back to your second question, how can we better use technology to, to defend democracy in, I, in Latin America? I think you know, a key way to do that is by using technology to document human rights abuses and strengthening democracy. And we do that, for example, at Human Rights Watch, we have a digital lab. And what we do is use technology to generate irrefutable evidence. And let me give you just a few examples. So for example, we've used satellite imagery to show that in the south of Venezuela, there are increasing areas of the country that are being illegally mined. And that illegal gold mining is carried out by illegal armed groups. And what we can show through the satellite imagery is that this territory is growing and this has an impact on the environment. It has an impact on rights and it complements the work that you would do interviewing people. We've used open source investigation, for example, to document police brutality and abuse during protests. When I go and document repression during a protest, it doesn't make sense for me to be in the middle of the mess because I can only see very close to where I am. So you, know, you can look at what's happening from above, from a balcony, from a terrace, but you rely on videos and images by people who are in different places that can show with images what is actually happening. Of course, there's the issue of verification, right? You need to rely on images that you can verify by speaking to whoever filmed it, by using technology to verify the images and the metadata in the images. But it's an irrefutable evidence of abuse that can complement reporting by independent sources like us or independent journalists. And the other way I think you know, technology can be used is by being innovative in the way we show our findings. So for example, next week we're gonna be producing a report on prison massacres in Ecuador. And what we've done with the images that we got through different sources is reconstruct what happened in one of the prison massacres through a 3D reconstruction. So that whenever you go, hopefully you all go to the website next week and you can see that, you can actually walk through what happened that day. And we are showing with images that the police took hours to intervene when the prison massacre started. So I think it's essential to use technology to provide evidence of human rights abuses to verify the information because we don't want to contribute to misinformation through this reporting um, and to use it with the purpose of exposing abuse and generating accountability and strengthening democracy. But quickly, Tamara, before we go to President Frank, okay, you talked about using te technology to document human rights abuses, but what about something that we're all very concerned with, which is fake news? How can we use, and the question goes to anybody who wants to, how can we use better use technology to fight fake news? Well, that, that's what I emphasize, the, the need for verification of images, right? Like I can't take a photograph of a malnourished kid 
which someone sends to me through WhatsApp and say, you know, and I get this, and they say, like, this is happening in a Venezuelan hospital. Like, I, how will I know that this is Venezuela? How will I know that this is a hospital? And how will I know that this is now, right? So for that, you can rely on, you know, testimony, who took the, fo the, picture, the um, photograph. You can look at the actual information in the video as long as it's not shared through WhatsApp because you lose I, the basic information, and right? I, and and I, think the, I think the way forward, and I don't know how you get there, but the way forward has got to be uh, with artificial intelligence. Well, that was my and question. Ronnie, can't we use learning. blockchain to do that? Yeah, you could. I mean, there's, uh, there's like um, uh, permissionless trust you can verify on particular blockchains and you could timestamp and you can validate in multiple ways and I think that's super interesting. It's also the basis of some of these self-sovereign cryptocurrencies. So there's the, and it's not perfect, but it's emerging and it can help you with what you're doing. And if you make if you make the platforms if you add liability to what the platforms put out, I guarantee you there's billions of dollars for research in advancing this. President Frank, you're you preside over a major university. What can universities do to push this agenda of defending, of using technology to defend democracy? Well, let me first, uh, again, as I said yesterday, thank Concordia for opening this space, and I want to thank the Knight Foundation. This is the third of three Knight conversations on the intersection between tech and democracy. We're, we're trying to, to amplify this conversation. This is not the end. We produce Ronnie as the first author and Francis Davis and myself a white paper that we're hoping to publish on this um, really alternative we have for us between computational democracy and computational autocracy. The way in which current technologies may power either democratic processes or autocratic processes. The problem is not technology in itself and we need to be very clear about that. You know, it's been said <clears throat> that if the first use of electricity had been to power an electric chair, we may still be using candles uh, to, to light uh, our homes and, and gas to light the streets. It is the use that we make. <clears throat> it is also true that the technologies we're talking about, particularly artificial intelligence, are qualitatively different in, in, in an interconnected world because of the pervasiveness with which they can falsify reality. Uh, and, and that is the big challenge. If the essence of democracy is an informed citizenry, that is the big challenge. Now, universities, your question, I think have <coughs> four fundamental roles. First of all, almost all of the technologies we have talked about have their origin in fundamental research, and the vast majority of that research is carried out in universities. And we must not forget both the technologies we're talking about and almost everything else, the vaccines that we've that have saved the day with the, with the pandemic. All of that starts with basic research. And it's not just that technologies arise spontaneously. They are founded on fundamental research that needs to continue to be funded. The second function of universities is what we've been doing these two days, is the convening. It's the creating neutral spaces where diverging perspectives can come together to analyze critical topics. And, and, and that it's very much tied to a third role. Universities by design are seedbeds of critical thinking, of questioning. This is what universities were created to do. And therefore, we typically are a counterbalance to autocratic tendencies. A lot of social and movements, movements for independence, for civil rights, had their origins, for example, in student activism. And it's not a surprise because universities selectively recruit critical people who question whatever structures of power they are. Um, and then there is a very important role for universities, which I call it to be exemplary institutions. It's an old idea that universities as communities ought to adopt, adopt values and exhibit actual behaviors that serve as an example to the society of which they are a part. And I think in this current climate, one of the most important of those values is the relentless pursuit of truth. We understand that truth is dynamic and contradictory. It's a complex process, but it's the pursuit of truth that's the fundamental value. And in a time of post-truth politics, I think 
do, in everything we do, like holding this conversation we're holding, adhering to those principles uh, are very important. The last thing I will say is, as I was listening to Matt uh, yesterday on the history of Concordia, it became clear that the founders had the idea of this very meeting when they were students, and as soon as they graduated, they came out and founded this forum. And that leads to the fifth and probably the most important role for universities. We educate the next generation of leaders, and if we do that in the spirit of these values, as we fulfill the exemplary role, that is our best promise for preserving the, the, the values and practices of democracy. President Frank, our time is up, but in 30 seconds, when I go home and watch this video with all these great ideas, my first question will be, okay, what's next? What are you guys going to do with all this wonderful information? Well, we're going to try to continue to underscore uh, the, the duality that, that Ronnie and Tamara and Alberto have established. We have managed to develop technologies that have an incredible potential either to be a threat to democracy and a fuel for autocratic regimes, and that is happening in real time, or we can channel this maybe through a constitutional, uh, a global constitutional convention to make sure that those technologies, which do have the potential to preserve uh, sovereignty, so sovereign uh, uh, systems, to protect them from corruption, that that's the pathway that, that we take. And, and it, it is by creating this conversation that we may eventually, as Alberto said, we are walking there. We, we, we can't run because the technology itself is evolving as fast as the misuses of that technology. So, so we got to continue the, the conversation and build that consensus towards a, a different pathway. Wow, a lot to digest. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.